All right, next up we're gonna do the motion picture menu. So what I want you to do, if you're on the uh, M mode, just go to the motion picture icon on the mode dial and then go ahead and hit the menu button. You'll notice in the upper left-hand corner the REC menu is gone because we're not shooting stills anymore. So we're in the motion picture menu. And at the very top we got photo style. I'm gonna have a whole entire chapter on it because this is very important to get the, the look of your camera right because basically we're baking in the image. And what I mean by baking it in, it's kind of like if you took, um, you're making cookies and you're putting the flour and the sugar, or in this case, like white balance or picture styles or contrast or sharpness, and you're mixing up in a bowl, you put in the oven, you, well, you, you take the chocolate chip cookies out of the oven, let's say, um, they're baked and you can't separate those things back out again. Like you can with raw, like in this camera, if you shoot, um, daylight white balance for instance if you bring it at the lightroom into your uh, computer you can go from to sunny or tungsten or you can change it later uh, quite easily things that we're doing in the movies are similar to jpegs so when you shoot a jpeg image um, it's baked in the white balance the picture styles the a lot of the contrast the saturation um, that stuff is baked in, so we've got to be really careful. And that's why I'm going to devote a whole entire chapter to this later. But basically what I want to show you is go ahead and hit the menu button. I want to show you basically um, how to change things. So if we use the right or left cursor, I'm going to use the right one. We're going to step through all the different um, picture styles. This is monochrome, scenery, portrait, custom, cine like D, cine like V, standard, vivid, and back to natural. Again, I am going to do an entire chapter on this. Um, what I want to do is show you my kind of my generic settings, things that I shoot with a lot um, that'll work pretty much in everyday situations. That won't work in all situations, but at least get you started. I want you to use the down cursor arrow and I want you to use the left cursor and I want you to bring the contrast, this is the contrast, and bring it all the way down. I'll explain more later. I'll take the sharpness, um, bring that all the way down cursor down, noise reduction, for right now we're just gonna leave it at zero. And the next one is saturation, bring that down one click. Um, the hue, we're not gonna touch. And then either, you know, on the bottom here, on the lower right here, you're gonna see the set. You can use your finger and I can touch the screen or you can just hit the set button uh, on the side of the camera. All right, next up is 4K photo. This is a really cool feature. And if you don't see this on page one of your motion picture, um, you're probably not updated to 2.0 on their firmware. And if you see it grayed out, you're in a different system frequency. So basically this does two different things for us, um, stills related item and it's got video related item as well. Really quick on the still side, basically you can loop the recording and extract images out with EXIF data included, um, which is really cool, I guess, if you're trying to capture a single moment, like you're dropping something into water and you can't time it quite right, but you wanna extract the frame because you're doing, let's say, 30 frames per second or, or like that, you'll have 30 <laughs> chances in that one second, whereas you know, a burst rate on the camera might only be 10 frames per second. Again, this is not really a photography related course, but I just wanted to mention that. The other item that is very cool is you can do anamorphic lenses with this camera and this mode. Um, I can't actually go into this menu right now because the HDMI, and I'll show you some B-roll of what it looks like um, inside of there. But basically you can go in and you can choose a one by one aspect ratio. It says 2880 by 2880 in terms of pixels. And if you get a lens on there, that's anamorphic, you can get some really cool looking images. One of the things that um, the GH4 kind of gets knocked for a little bit is a little bit too sharp of an image um, and people think it's not enough cinematic looking. Well, I can tell you, if you definitely put some anamorphic glass on here and you use this feature, you're gonna get a very distinctive film looking look that people will be like, what did you shoot that with? It's amazing. Um, so let me show you in, uh, in post what this looks like. All right, in After Effects, these files are courtesy of Luke Newman, a friend of mine who let me um, use this for this demonstration. Actually, you can download these as well. Um, if you're familiar with After Effects, uh, you'll kind of understand what I'm doing. But here's one of his images, um, one of his video files. We can actually play through it here. I'll just cursor through a little bit. But basically, what you can do, and it, 
Luke has a very uh, an awesome tutorial on this. Um, again, I'm brand new to this. If we hit S on here, we can change the scaling. You can see it's a totally square image. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the composition settings. Um, we'll unlock it and we'll change it to 4096 by 2160. Um, so now we're going to take this on the scale and we're going to unclick here and then I'm going to stretch this out to be 190 on the horizontal. And then I'm going to put that um, constraint back on and then bring the image, image back down again. Um, doesn't quite fit perfectly for the lens he was using, which is almost uh, as referred to as a I believe a 2x anamorphic. And if you're familiar with any of the J.J. Abrams movies that has lens flares going all over the place, if you shine a light into an anamorphic lens, it'll flare kind of in a horizontal sense. You'll get it kind of going through the image like that. Um, really thin lens flares. Um, so again, if you're really looking to get a cinematic look out of the GH4, this is definitely a really cool option that Panasonic has added. Again, I, I'm, I'm sorry I haven't done a lot with this because this is a brand new feature that just came out, but that's basically the workflow is you record it to the SD card in a square format, um, depending on the lens that you're using, and then bring it in and stretch it out this way. All right, moving down, we've got recording format. So if you hit uh, enter here, you'll have a whole bunch of different options. We've got AVC HD, MP4, MP4 with a, a linear pulse code modulation uh, in terms of audio and we've got MOV. And then inside of that, for each one of these, if we go down to here, we've got lots of different options and lots of different frame rates for each one. There's probably maybe 50, 60, 70 different combinations of compression, uh, file format, um, frame rates. Um, so what I basically I'm gonna boil it down to just a couple of them that you really just need to use. Right off the bat, what we're gonna do is, let's uh, get out of here and go back up to record format. We're gonna go through each one. Um, AVC, H, AVC HD um, was developed, I think, back in 2006 by Panasonic and Sony, and it was mostly for Blu-ray. And as you can see here, if we choose it and we go down to here, our highest uh, bit rate we can get is 28 meg. Um, as you can see in the upper right hand corner next to the 60p. So that's one of the first limitations, whereas MOV and MP4, we can go to 200 meg, and the higher bit rate, the better in terms of image quality. So 28 is just not gonna cut it for us. The second reason is AVC HD has a file limitation. So basically when you hit four gig on the card, it stops recording, whereas MOV and MP4, you can record until the card fills up. It might separate those into separate files, but you can just continuously record, which is a wonderful thing. And the third thing is, let's go ahead and get out of here. And if I go down to luminance level, which we're gonna talk more about later, you're gonna notice that we have um, zero to 255 grayed out. Uh, and I'll show you what this means. Basically, we're limited to two out of three choices on our luminance level, whereas MOV, and MP4, we are not. All right, so that leaves us with two varieties of MP4 and an MOV. So let's just choose MOV for instance. It's gonna say, hey, you need a higher performance PC to required to play and edit this type of file, which says it for MP4 as well. Would you like to proceed? Just say yes. It's just warning you, hey, you better have a pretty decent computer to be able to do this. Uh, even there's, there's some laptops that can handle this, actually no problem. I just purchased one for about a thousand dollar laptop and it can handle these files. So if you have any modern day computer, you shouldn't have too much of a problem. So now if we go down to record quality, you're gonna see that we have a bunch of different options. We've got 4K, two varieties of 4K, a bunch of FHD, which stands for Full HD, which is basically 1080. Um, lots of different choices here. But something that you're gonna notice that we're missing, um, that may be the reason you bought this camera, is you're not gonna see one that says Cinema 4K or C4K. And also you're gonna notice that you don't have any like all, you see this one that says all I, 200 meg, um, you know, full HD, but it says 60p and it doesn't say like 24p. So you're thinking, well, I wanted to shoot it at this super high bit rate, why can't I choose it? So let me show you why you can't choose it. It's because we're set on a different system frequency. So what I want you to do is go all the way down to the wrench icon 
where it says setup and go page five of six where it says system frequency and then the camera comes stock in the NTSC uh, mode or if it's shipped to a different part of the country it might be actually set up in PAL like that one but what we want to do is we want to set our system frequency to 24 uh, Hertz so go ahead and choose that it's gonna say hey you need to turn off your camera um, so I'm gonna turn the camera off turn it back on again and then we go back into the menu you can see that it's chosen for us so now we're gonna head back up to page uh, one of six on the motion picture back up where we were before and what I want you to do is actually go up to recording format remember how I said we had four different choices well now boom <laughs> we're limited to two we got the mp4 with the good audio uh, linear pulse code modulation and we've got the MOV which also has pretty much the same audio and we'll get into more than that in a second so let's say if we choose MOV again and then we go down to uh, rec quality and we curse all the way up the top here we're gonna see oh we got our cinema 4k and we've got our um, 200 meg bit rate all I uh, full HD 1080 at 24 frames per second so we got lots of great different options now all right next up we're gonna talk about compression um, we've got two different types that were in in this mode MOV or mp4 um, you're gonna notice in the upper right hand corner of this box in yellow it says all I and then you're gonna notice the other ones like these two 4k modes don't have anything written and down here these two and eight two 1080 modes don't have anything written um, those are all IPB I'm not sure why they don't label them that way because they have room if they could spell all I with four letters they could put IPB in but basically uh, the difference between all I and IPB is all I is a big file size IPB is a smaller compressed file size so there's more compression going on all I is easier on your computer to do editing with and IPB is harder to do editing with um, and that's basically the differences between the two all right moving back up to recording format so we're basically left with mp4 and MOV so what are the differences between the two are there any differences between the two so before I explain what the differences are um, let me show you an example I'm using running water here because it's usually pretty good in terms of uh, very random things going on the water is going in lots of different paths and so many of the pixels are changing in different ways constantly in a very random way um, and so one the first one we're going to show is MOV and then it's going to skip to mp4 and both of them recorded at 1080 200 uh, meg in terms of the bitrate and all i compression and M, uh, 24p so let's go ahead and watch So as you can see, or at least the way I look at it, they look identical. Um, the water obviously was running slightly different from one to the next, but they're pretty much identical. So I, I opened up a program that looks deep inside of each one of these files, MOV and MP4. Um, and I looked at all of the attributes for each one of the files. And basically, they're identical. Um, so basically, what is what are MP4? and MOV they're basically wrappers they wrap around what's inside of the actual video file um, and inside of each one of these wrappers is basically an h.264 file um, so they're basically the same thing so comparison wise mp4 versus MOV they both have the same max bit rate of 211 at least that program I used um, they both use the same profile the high L 5.1 they both use the same audio format, PCM. They both had the same sample frequency of 48K, and they both had the audio bit rate of 536K. Um, and they both had the same file size. And when I brought them into my computer and looked at the resources used in terms of the CPU when I was playing it back in my nonlinear editor, they both used the exact same amount of CPU. So they're pretty much exactly the same. All right, I think we're at a really good point now to talk about SD cards because we're talking about file formats like MOV and MP4 that can get really high bit rates in the camera, 
which might cause issues. Um, I use a certain card um, that uh, Panasonic doesn't necessarily recommend. They re recommend the uh, UHS Speed Class 3, like a SanDisk Screen Pro 280 megabytes per second card. The 32 gig that I'm looking at right now is at $115. At today's prices, whenever you're watching this, I'm sure the prices will go down. The one I'm holding and the one I've been using is about $47, 32 gig, and this one's rated at 95 megabytes per second. Now, the reason they're recommending that card, the more expensive card, over this one is the, the more expensive one is guaranteed not to fall below a certain threshold uh, in terms of bitrate and make your camera, your GH4, stop recording which kind of suck. If you're going along, you have a perfect take and all of a sudden it says it's stop and it says, well, your card's too slow, it wasn't writing fast enough because the information coming off the sensor down through the buffer onto the card, if it doesn't write fast enough to the card, it won't be able to handle it. Um, so what I would recommend, um, it's a slight gamble, but I think you're in good shape because I know other people have the exact same card and have had no crashing issues because of it, is to get this one. It's only $47, like I said before. Um, I've done speed tests on it, and I usually write them on the back so I know, because every card's different. This one is um, tested at 80 megabytes um, per second, um, which is the important number, because it's the right speed. And it, it reads at 91 meg. So it's really fast. I would recommend if you have some really older cards, um, maybe from a Canon T2i or whenever you bought your first SD cards, um, I'd probably get rid of them or even hold on to them. But um, just offloading the media um, can go so much faster on a USB 3 drive into your computer with these cards because it can read really fast as well. So write speed, very important for the camera. Read speed, not as important, but um, so that's my recommendation. It's kind of a slight gamble, but I think your chances are good that you'll get a very fast card. And you can run a speed test on it. Um, but again, I have had no issues with this card. So you got Cinema 4K, um, which I don't use. If you're gonna use that kind of aspect ratio, you can see it's a bit wider than this one in terms of the width. Um, and you may be thinking, well, it's got more resolution. I should use that one. Well. You can, but it's just kind of a pain in the butt if you're publishing um, to the web and you're in a 16 by nine aspect ratio, you're gonna have to do stuff, stuff in post. So um, I usually leave it in the second option. Whereas if you're doing stuff for the theater or wherever else, which I don't publish to, um, I guess you could definitely use this aspect ratio. There's a number of reasons I shoot in 4K. And the first one is, um, a terrible editor and I, I like to have choices when I edit and 4k gives that to you if you're shooting an interview or let's say you just have one camera in an interview situation and you have no other camera to cut to um, and you don't want to you want to be able to hide that jump cut well you can punch in punch out and act like it's actually two different cameras so 4k is a wonderful thing also you could like do a slider move across a 4K image in a 1080 timeline because there's so much real estate and you can actually make it look like a really smooth slider move, um, which is really cool. Um, the next thing is noise and artifacting, compression blocking and stuff like that. All that stuff gets downsampled to 1080 when you publish 1080 and it becomes smaller. So the noise becomes smaller. The macro blocking, the artifacting, all the weird stuff gets smaller and um, you can see less. So um, I think just 4K is definitely all around a, a great way to go. One of the reasons I bought this camera, this has a, when it records 4K, it has a one by one pic pixel map. So what does that mean? Basically, it doesn't do any line skipping, line binning, or anything like the Canon cameras did. And that's one of the reasons I moved to the GH4. It was this one particular reason, is it gets rid of aliasing and moray. Where when you start doing line skipping and stuff like that, you can see artifacts on like telephone lines and brick walls and stuff like that. You don't have to worry about that when you're shooting in 4K. When you do shoot in 1080 um, at different frame rates, let's say, um, slow motion, you can get some of that, but if you're going for that super clean image um, with tons of detail, um, boy, you just can't beat 4K. So I would pick, you know, either of these two options at the top and pretty much shoot that way all the time unless you need slow motion. All right, next up is exposure mode. Um, you have different options. You've got aperture priority, shutter priority, 
you got your P mode, um, and then you've got M for manual. Um, right now, I believe you were probably set on P mode. So let me demonstrate what this looks like. So if I move the camera into a very dark location, like shooting at the tripod that's shooting me right now, you'll notice the exposure changed. And if I move it back to that very sunny out, outside, um, you can see it shifted back. So now if I go into the menu, and I set this to manual, and I do the same thing, you'll notice that when I go to the dark area, it, the exposure does not change. Um, I would advise you guys to stick it in uh, the M mode. And if you need to, um, we're, we'll talk about other situations where if you're going from a bright sunny um, environment, like on a, a glide cam, for instance, and you're going into a dark area, there'll be other ways to do this. Uh, but right now, to keep things very simple, um, I think the, the, the results that you're wanting to get, you don't want the chain, the camera to change all by itself. All of a sudden, you don't know why. Um, I would highly recommend shooting in manual mode in terms of exposure. So let's leave that on M. All right, moving down, we have a variable frame rate, but you're like, ah, variable frame rate is grayed out. And that's something I love to use. It's, um, it's great for slow motion, for overcranking. And we'll, I'll demonstrate that here in a second. So if I move back up, you'll notice that we're in 4K. And when we cursor down, not to this one, but this one where it's 100 meg uh, full HD, you'll see at the very bottom it says VFR available, which stands for variable frame rate, which is a really cool option that this camera has. There's a lot of different things we can do with it. So let's go ahead and select this. And then we move down, you'll now you'll notice that variable frame rate is an option we can select. And right now, instead of turning it on, we're gonna just go to set. And so right now it's set at 24 frames per second. Um, and then you can up it to like 60 and all the way up to 96 so you can get silky smooth slow motion. Now a couple things to keep in mind when you're shooting slow motion with this camera is for one you get no audio which kind of stinks. I wish it had audio because there's sometimes I like to shoot in slow motion with audio. Um, but the other thing is you lose autofocus which not that big of a deal because most of the stuff we're going to be doing is going to be manual focus. When you record at 96 frames per second, um, the image is at 1080, which is wonderful, but it's going to get a bit on the soft side in terms of the detail. You're going to lose a little bit of detail. So a lot of the times what I will do is I'll record it. Usually the highest I do is 60 frames per second because the detail is definitely there. It's definitely not as good as shooting a regular 1080, you lose a little bit of detail, but um, it gives you some nice, again, like I said, silky smooth, smooth low, slow motion, um, and I definitely recommend it. You can also go the opposite way. You can actually bring the frame rate down to like two frames per second, and why would you wanna do that? Well, you could kinda of say you could create kind of like almost like a time lapse. This would be one way in a video mode. So if you pointed it up at the clouds and it's just doing two frames a second, when you bring it back in your timeline and you conform it the way you want, you could speed those clouds up, um, would definitely be an option. Um, there's other ways to do that and I would actually recommend uh, when we get to the time lapse chapter to um, try what I will be suggesting later. Um, but for right now, uh, if you are going to shoot um, slow motion, um, if you want super slow motion, go to 96. If you And if you want some decent amount of detail, um, definitely put it at 60. All right, next up we have AFS, AFF. Um, again, I usually leave it on uh, S for single or still, whatever you want to think about it in terms of landscapes. Um, we kind of covered this already. And again, we'll have a whole chapter on focus later. Picture mode. This is kind of a kind of an interesting concept where you can take pictures while you're recording video. It's grayed out because we're shooting in 4K right now. I would, you know, it's this is more of a stills related item. I would now with this new feature that you have for 4K photo, I would use that um, rather than pressing the shutter button down while you're recording video because the whole camera is going to shake while you push it down. I'd rather extract it the other way. So we'll just move on. Uh, continuous autofocus. You got on and off. Um, I leave it on. Um, you need to have this on to do the tracking of faces and also tracking in terms of uh, moving around the frame for continuous autofocus. And we'll be demonstrating that more later. So just go ahead and leave this on for now um, and we'll come back to that. 
All right, next up we have metering mode. Um, we have three different choices. We have multiple, um, center weighted average, and spot. To be honest, I don't use the meter on this camera as much as I used to with the Canon cameras. And when we get into zebras um, and other stuff, I'll kind of explain why, but um, I typically leave it either on this one or the center weighted average. So basically this one looks at the entire frame where center weighted average looks more in the center of the frame and then spot looks at a very tiny part of the frame. If you're looking at me in the terms of the frame, it's very small whereas center weighted average is more of this, whereas multi is like the entire frame. Let, let's go ahead and demonstrate this. So we're gonna go to multi and right now I'm at 50th of a second, ISO 200 and uh, f-stop of 10. We're gonna cover more about exposure in another chapter, but you'll see right in the center there, there's a plus minus and an, a zero right in the center on the bottom. Now watch when I move it to the dark area, you're gonna see it's basically going to about a negative three um, exposure. So it's saying, hey, you're not really exposed properly, you're about three stops down. Whereas if I go here, it's saying, hey, you're, uh, you're pretty much even. And now it's about a third, oh, there it goes. So now if I go to the menu and I choose the center weighted and let's go ahead and rotate again. And you can see it's a little bit different, but it's looking kind of at the center of the frame. So if I put it right between the outside and inside, I'm a third of a stop down. And if I go to the full frame, you can see I'm two thirds of a stop down. So it's looking at the entire frame, which is including probably more darkness on the right hand side saying, hey, it's a little bit darker. Um, now if we go to spot and then we go, you can see there now there's like a little um, cyan, maybe blue colored uh, uh, crosshair in the center. And you can see now as I move it around, like right if I get to the edge here, you can see it's coming up and then it gets into that kind of area where there's kind of like a reflection. It's even. And now let's go to that tree and you can see it's now it's starting to come down. If I go to that right in the center there, you can see now it's a full stop down. So this is really good if you want to um, find something in the frame that you want to expose to. Um, the only time I ever really use this is where I use like an 18% gray card, which we'll, we'll demonstrate when we get to the exposure chapter. Um, but for right now, um, metering mode, I mostly leave it either in center weighted average or the, the full frame one. So it's up to you on what you're gonna be doing with it. And again, we're gonna be talking about zebras and a whole bunch of other cool features this camera has later. All right, next up is shadow and highlights. So go ahead and hit the set button. Um, and you can cursor around with your right and left arrow keys. You can also hit the display button if you don't want it to be overlaid on top of it. Um, I personally don't care, so I'm just gonna go back to where we were before with the overlay. And if you step through, you can see we got an S-curve for contrast, inverted S-curve for less contrast. Um, here, the highlights are linear, whereas you've got your shadows boosted. Or you can create your own. Um, you can use the front dial to change the highlights, or you can use the rear dial to change the shadows. Just so you guys know, um, I typically, for most of my shooting, will use it in the plus one shadow. So I'm boosting the shadows ever so slightly. Um, and we're gonna get more into that later. And then when you're done customizing the way you like it, you can just hit the set button or you can actually save it to custom one, which we'll get into more about what that is later. Um, but when you're done, basically you can just hit the set button here or there and I'll remember where you're at. So if you come out of here, You'll notice in the upper right hand corner below the no flash symbol, you'll see a, a box with a curve in it. So if I go back to shadow highlights and I go back to linear and I go back to the main screen, you'll see that that box goes away. So it's indicating, hey, you've done something with the shadow and highlights. All right, next up is eye dynamic. And I would recommend you guys leave this off. So if we go into the menu, we can see we got low, standard, high, and auto. I'm gonna choose high. You'll notice a slight exposure difference when I kick it out into the men out of the menu. And then if I go from high down to off, you'll notice that the exposure decreased ever so slightly. And it's really hard to tell the difference in a, a well-lit situation like this, the difference between what iDynamic is doing in terms of high versus off. 
So in the manual it says it just contrast and exposure automatically. That's like, whoa, I don't know if I want that to happen. And I've talked to Panasonic about this and basically, from what I understand, there's like thousands of tiny boxes within your frame. And iDynamics allowed to bring it up a third of a stop to a whole full stop um, for each one of those thousands of boxes inside the frame. So let me show you an example of where it does a kind of a nasty thing in a really low light situation like this. And this is a shot with eye dynamic turned off. It's kind of a very dimly lit scene. And I was wondering what eye dynamic name would, would do to it. And here we go with eye dynamic turned on. And you can see there's a whole bunch of smeariness going on. There's macro blocking. Sure, I can see into the shadows a lot better, but at what cost? I mean, it looks like nasty noise reduction or something. It looks really bad. And here it is with it turned off. So I'd say in really low light situations, I would say definitely turn it off. All right, next up is eye resolution. So go ahead and go into the menu. We've got lots of different choices here, high, standard, low, and extended. Um, one thing I will tell you when you're in movie mode, um, low and extended are the exact same thing. At least that's what the manual says. So you've got basically two lows. And this was designed as a still related item for tele shooting where it wanted to add more resolution, um, perhaps uh, contrast around the edges to make things maybe sharper. Um, I'm gonna advise you guys just to leave this off. Um, just turn it off because the reason is the GH4 is such a sharp camera to begin with in terms of its resolution. You almost wanna, like I talked about before, we turned the sharpness all the way down. And we're gonna be covering more about sharpness and showing what that does later and a chapter about picture styles. But I would advise turning this off. This was a stills related item that the engineers probably said, you know what, we could throw this in the menu for the video guys and see if they like it. Um, again, this would be something I would definitely recommend turning off because the, this, this camera is already so sharp or so much detail already. We don't need to be adding any more. All right, next up is master pedestal level. Let's go ahead and hit the set menu and I'm gonna point this kind of in a dark area so you can see what's going on. I'm gonna go ahead and raise the level up to plus 15 and you can see that the you're seeing more detail into the shadows. And then I'm gonna go ahead and bring this down. This is basically crushing the blacks and bringing them down. Um, this is originally designed, I believe, uh, I've never used some of their broadcast cameras Panasonic has, but I understand that this is designed for this camera to be matched up with other uh, broadcast cameras in a broadcast situation where they're trying to match the cameras in terms of the the black level. Um, I'd be a little leery about using this too much um, because when you do bring it up to plus 15, and I don't know if you can see it, but it brings up the noise um, depending on the, the shot. And we're going to cover this more later in our picture style, our picture profile chapter. Um, I would advise actually leaving it at zero, and that's where I use it, it's at zero. And you remember before under the, um, if we go back up to highlights and shadows, remember I added a plus one in the shadows. But if you look at that curve, uh, the curve is pinned at zero, and I'm basically raising, raising the shadows, but I'm not raising the lower part of that curve that where it's pinned to zero. Whereas Master Pedestal, on the other hand, um, it's bringing up what is at zero and bringing it up. So you might be introducing a lot of noise. And again, I will show a lot of examples of this later. All right, next up is luminance level. So if we press the set button, you'll see we have three different choices. If one is grayed out, you're probably on AVC HD. So we got zero to 255, so this baby is your blackest blacks to your whites. Um, and maybe not the whitest whites, because I'll, I'll show you that reason in a, a minute. Um, 16 to 235, so things have gotten compressed, I guess you could say, in terms of the, the range of the blackest blacks to the whitest whites. And then we got 16 to 255, which introduces kind of super whites, which uh, what I'm seeing in my Premiere Pro. Um, I want to preface this by saying I am not a broadcast engineer. Um, I publish mostly to YouTube and Vimeo, and this is more, from my understand, a broadcast type of um, tool where you want to limit the range to from 16 to 235 uh, for Blu-rays or broadcasts, where you want to stay in some sort of legal limit. Um, so let me let me show you examples of what's going on here. So this first example is um, 
zero to 255. And what I want you to pay attention to is the brights, brightest areas and the darkest areas. And I'm gonna, now I'm gonna click over to 16 to 235. And let me, I'm gonna click back. And you're gonna notice that there really is no difference between the two. Where you should have been saying, well, wait a minute, Dave. I thought you said they were compressed. Um, on the 16 to 235, shouldn't I see the black levels raised and the whites down a little bit? Well, that's where it gets interesting in today's software. I believe that from what I understand is the GH4, even when you're in this limited range, it's still recording the full signal. And then when you bring it into your nonlinear editor like Premiere Pro, it's saying, oh, I see the whole entire level. I'm gonna show it to you. So there's no difference between the two that I can see between these two. But when we go to 16 to 255, oh, it just got brighter. Um, let me show you what's going on. So here is, zero to 255, a different scene. And you can see those clouds are just ever so slightly blown out. I put my zebras at 100 and I overexposed ever so slightly because I wanted to see where, what was happening with the, the whitest whites. Um, when I go to 16 to 235, the waveform looks exactly the same. And I go back and you're gonna notice a little bit difference just because of that branch on the right hand side is moving slightly. But when I go to 16 to 255, well, you'll notice on the IRE, it's now going above 100 and it's going to 110. And I believe that's what's called super whites. So the image appears brighter, basically. Um, so now I wanna show you something that's, I, I haven't brought this up to the Panasonic engineers yet, but I think there's something odd going on here. So we're gonna get to color bars later and this thing outputs um, color bars, which I think you'll need in a broadcast setting. But I noticed something very odd. When you, you output 0 to 255, um, you'll notice that those boxes, the gratic graticules, I believe they're called, the red, magenta, yellow, green, cyan, blue boxes, there's little white dots that should be inside the boxes, but they're not. But when we go to the 16 to 235 range, all of a sudden, the, the, those pinpoint white dots are in the correct boxes. So. I haven't brought this up to the Panasonic engineers, but I have a feeling something odd's going on with the color bars. Cause I started thinking, well, maybe I should be recording at 16 to 235 cause that's a more accurate color space cause everything's lining up correctly in terms of the colors. I don't think that's the reason. Let me, let me show you why. Here is a, an X-Rite um, color checker at zero to 255. And when we look at the same one, uh, 16 to 235. And I've looked at this on scopes and everything, and these look identical. So this is coming right out of the camera. It's not the bars coming out of an HDMI port, it's the actual camera um, sensor. And then when we go to um, 16 to 255, you can see it just gets brighter. So my advice to you is just to leave it on 255. Even though that two, 0 to 255 and 16 to 235 look identical in my NLE, they might look different in yours or they might look different in speed grade or DaVinci Resolve. Um, I would say keep it on 0 to 255. If mentally, you'll just say, I'm, hey, I'm capturing the full range. Um, it's just one thing that you don't really have to worry about. And this will both work in MOV and MP4 as well. One other thing I wanna to add to the luminance range is banding. So I ran a bunch of banding tests thinking, well, if I change the range and I'm using less of the signal, am I gonna get more banding? Um, for instance, if those there's people out there that are thinking, well, I wanna use the 16 to 235, am I gonna increase banding? Because basically you're going to limit how many steps of shades of gray or uh, luminance there are. Um, but I ran a ton of different tests. Let me show you, this is the first test at zero to 255. And I've got a, just a regular blue sky going between, in Colorado, it's very blue, um, all the way to the top, all the way to the horizon where it gets lighter. And you can see there's no banding going on. Now here's 16 to 235, same thing. And I could not see any difference in banding at all. And just for kicks, I did 16 to 255 and I couldn't see any banding going on there. So I thought to myself, well, let's increase this a bit. So I, where you're gonna get banding is when you increase the saturation and contrast. So I increased the saturation all the way up, add as much contrast as I could in curves and as well as contrast setting in the picture style. And here's zero to 255. 
you can see it's a lot darker and as we go to horizon so I'm seeing very little banding going on here. However, what you're probably seeing, and I've already uploaded this to YouTube and Vimeo to see what happens when this goes up on the internet. And sure enough, the banding gets more exacerbated, gets worse basically. Um, but the, the important part here is all three of these are banding about the same amount. So it really doesn't matter which levels you're on in terms of banding. All right, next up is a uh, synchro scan. Um, this is a wonderful feature. At some point in your career, you're going to have to shoot somebody with a monitor or a TV or something in the background um, like this that might have flickering or have these kind of weird things going on with the image. Um, and it might be very distracting if that's in the background. So you want to get rid of it. So this camera at this point has this really cool feature, which is awesome. So if you turn it on, you'll notice that there's a number of peers on your screen as an overlay. And you can use your right and left arrow keys um, to cursor to basically change it um, and you can fine tune it. Um, let me show you an example. So here I was just shooting my TV and you can see this all nasty type of weirdness um, going on with the screen. And next up you'll see that I changed it and now it works perfectly fine. There's no flickering, no sort of weird banding going on. Um, so yeah, it's an awesome feature to have when you find yourself in that situation where you have to record something with uh, a TV or a monitor in the background. All right, next up is external teleconversion. Um, this is basically only for 1080. So basically you can kind of double the reach of your lens. Let's say if you have a 12 to 35 and you wanted to make it look like a 70 and you're at all the way at 35 and you want to double it, you could go in here and turn this on. Um, if you're in 1080 mode, if you're in 4K mode, it doesn't do this because it's using the entire sensor. Whereas this is using uh, different portion of the sensor. So you might be asking, well, that's kind of a cool thing. I could get more reach out of my lens, or you could think about it a different way. Why don't you just shoot in 4K? And if you need to, you can basically zoom in and post because you can zoom into the frame. So what I did is I've created a side-by-side -side example, and I'm going to show you the difference between the two. And there's basically a vertical swipe going across the screen, going about maybe this fast. And if you can't see it, um, which you might not be able to see, then there pretty much is no difference. And I've looked at both of these many times. Um, on the left-hand side is the 1080, and on the right-hand side is the 4K. Um, one shot at 200 meg um, bitrate, and the other one shot at 100 meg bitrate. Um, so see if you can see the line going across the screen when I hit play. Right there, it's about halfway. And there it's all the way to the right side. Now it's coming back. Now it's about halfway. And it's pretty much ended. So if you couldn't see any difference going back and forth, that pretty much proves the point that just shoot in 4K and you can just crop in later if you want to. You have the advantage of cropping out or getting that wider shot. So I would almost recommend not using this and just shoot in 4K. All right, next up is digital zoom. Um, if you go into it, you can see we have a 2x and 4x, and basically this digitally zooms in, and I would, and it degrades the image um, heavily. I'll show you an example here in a, in a second. Um, I would advise just reaching for a longer lens and putting it on, and you'll have better quality than going into this mode. Just don't use this mode. So let me demonstrate. So here is at 4x, um, and you can see the image gets soft, and you can see there's, some weird stuff going on here, like especially on the trees, you can see, you know, kind of dancing around. And here is 2x, which is better, um, but I would still, I'd still advise not using this at all. Just reach for a longer lens, buy yourself a 35 to 100 Panasonic lens, which works really well, um, and you'll get more reach that way. All right, next up is time code. Um, I normally sync up my stuff using um, Premiere Pro if I have a two camera shoot. I sync it up with the audio. It looks at the waveform and it does usually a pretty good job about syncing it up on the timeline and then everything is matched between two camera angles. Or you can use Pluralize, which I've used in the past, which works really well. Or in this case, you can use timecode now because you can actually jam sync, if you know what that means, you can actually jam sync to the brick unit, the YAG unit, the, the unit that goes underneath this camera that costs more than the camera itself. And I'm guessing most of you guys don't own it. Um, if you're maybe in a situation in a studio where you do multicam shoots a lot, 
um, it might be worth it for you to look into. Um, I don't do that type of thing. So for me, it's not worth buying a $2,000 unit um, to get this advantage. But from my understand, you can jam sync each one of these. And I think you have to do it like every four hours to keep them perfectly aligned. Um, and then when you bring all your cameras into your nonlinear editor, boom, say sync, sync up using time code, and they'll sync up perfectly from my understand. Um, I could just tell you really quick, uh, again, I don't use it this often, but like rec run, uh, it says count up during recording only, whereas free run is a continuous count up. So uh, where you might want to use rec run is like an interview situation where you're just letting the camera roll. And free run, where it's continuously counting up, um, you might want to use like in a concert situation where you're doing lots of starts and stops. All right, next up is HDMI record output. And like I said before, I'm actually recording the GH4 to a PCI card in my computer. Um, so I'm actually using it right now. So if I hit the set button, uh, we have a bunch of different options we can do when sending a signal to an external recorder, or in my case, I'm sending it to a computer. Um, at this recording, the Atomus Shogun is not out yet, which is a 4K recorder via HDMI, um, which gives you some pretty cool features. Um, I don't have one, but uh, spec-wise, it looks pretty darn cool. So the way the, the, this camera records without HDMI is it's 420 8-bit. So 420 um, has less color information than 422. So if you're doing things like green screen in a studio environment, um, this might be a really good option for you is to ex hook up an external recorder. Um, and also, in terms of the bit depth, um, it, like I said, records 8-bit to the card. So we basically have 256 I guess, shades in terms of like like a gradient, like what we showed before in terms of you don't want to get banding like in a blue sky gradient. You can see many different levels of blue in the sky. Well, 256, sometimes if you push that too far in post, like what we did with adding contrast and saturation, you can start to see banding. Well, if we switch this to 10-bit, then we have over a thousand different shades of that blue in the sky and the likelihood of banding goes way way down when you're punishing it in post by pushing the saturation and contrast so really cool option to have on this um, camera i'm glad they included it uh, moving down we have info display i'm ac I actually i have this turned on so you can actually see how i'm recording and you'll, you'll see you'll notice that i've zoomed in to just the display that you're seeing but you're actually seeing kind of out my window here as well. Um, so you can turn it on or off. Um, I think if you're recording um, 422 10 bit, you'll probably want to turn the display off. But for just demonstration purposes, it's great to have it on actually. And then um, in terms of 4K down convert, so let's say you're sending it out to a monitor just for display. Um, you can put on auto 1080 or you can turn it off altogether in terms of it's down converting. Um, I'm not, like I said, I don't have a Shogun. I don't know if auto would work or you would have to turn it off to transfer the full signal because I don't have one. But if let's say you have a small seven inch monitor that doesn't have a recorder in it and maybe it's having problems, well, you can force it to 1080 um, so it'll down convert for you and it should display on the monitor just fine. All right, moving down, um, we actually have an item grayed out here at sound output. And the reason is because um, I'm recording Oh, with the HDMI. But basically there's just two choices on sound output. It's rec sound and real time. So in a situation where you're, let's say you're doing an interview and you really wanna monitor the audio as you're doing an interview. I do this a lot. I'll be sitting next to the camera and I'll have my headphones on. I'll be asking questions. I'll be operating the camera, doing the interview, doing the lightings, doing everything. A lot of you guys are probably one band bands like myself. And one of the things you wanna make sure is, you know, you're gonna be, if it's recording on the tripod, you're pretty sure that, you know, the picture is locked down and you're okay. But in terms of audio, especially if you're using wireless um, or if you're using a boom mic and you wanna make sure that they're not uh, over modulating or distorting the audio, it's really good to wear headphones. Well, when you're wearing headphones, you can choose two items, the rec sound, which is the final recorded sound, or you can do real time. Now, if your headphones are not loud enough, um, cause if you can get them really loud, using a rec sound will work fine because you won't hear them talk and then about a hundred millisecond delay, you'll hear them in your headphones. Well, if your headphones are loud enough, it won't be distracting to, to you at all. 
um, and the way you deliver the questions, the way they answer them, you're not going to hear that 100 millisecond delay between the two of you. Um, or you could just leave it on real time. Um, basically what you're trying to listen for is distortion. Or if you're using an RF microphone, you're listening for dropouts and you're saying, oh crap, you know, somebody just came by and a truck came by and was squelching on your frequency and you'll have to do redo that take basically. So um, really cool option to listen to the rec sound. Again, I would, you could use either one, but if your headphones aren't loud enough, um, if you're using like just small earbuds, let's say, um, you might want to use real time because then you won't hear that delay. All right, next up is silent operation. Silent operation is different than silent mode. Silent mode makes the camera totally silent. Silent operation means that when you're operating the camera, like uh, with a power zoom, which we don't have, or you're changing the microphone level, or here, let me demonstrate. So basically if you go into it, you can either have it on or off. And I would recommend having it left on. So if we get out of here and we go to our main screen um, that you can see here, on the right hand side, about halfway up, you'll see a movie icon. If I touch it with my finger, you can see we get a whole bunch of different choices. So at the very top, you can go um, telephoto or wide if you had a zoom lens. Um, if you press the F, you can change the f-stop. So I could like, you can see how I'm changing it here, making it brighter or darker. Um, if I press the F button, uh, I can change the shutter speed, or I can go down and change the ISO, or the one I use the most, and the reason I leave this on is because of the microphone. And let's say you can actually see my levels right here. The down button brings it down um, and you just bring it all the way down to a negative 12. And that's usually where I record with. And we'll get more into the audio side of things later. And then when you're done with that menu, just press the um, movie icon and then it slides over to the side. Um, so that's pretty much it. Um, I would definitely leave that on just for the fact that you can get to change your microphone level quickly without deep diving into the menu. All right, next up is mic level display. Right now it's turned off. I would definitely advise just leaving this on. And so we go back to the main screen. You can see on the lower left-hand corner, you can now see the levels. Um, if we had that turned off, you would not see that. So I would definitely recommend leaving that display on all the time if you're doing lots of things like interviews or anything where you're wanting to capture audio. I get, you can obviously turn it off if you want, if you're shooting just B-roll only and you don't want that on the display and you're not worried about the sound. All right, next up we have mic level adjust. So if you hit the set button, you can get into it. And if you use your cursor buttons, you can go up and down and bring the preamp up and down, basically. Um, I would advise you guys, if, you want, if you're using this type of combination that I use a lot, you know, the Rode VideoMic Pro, right now it's being plugged into the Sony a7S, which is recording me. Um, and then the mic, what you're seeing here is actually coming from these mics here. If I scratch them, you can actually see it on the camera. If you use this kind of combination like I do using the Rode VideoMic Pro, which is a very hot, very sensitive microphone, has a battery built into it. Um, these cameras, the Sony cameras, the Panasonic cameras, the Canon cameras, all have um, somewhat noisy preamps. So if you pr the preamplifier that's built into it for the microphone, if you raise it up too high, like at zero or plus six on here, you're gonna hear um, some background, background noise come up. Um, if you're doing it such a way where you're using a VideoMic Pro, I would advise either set that at zero or plus 20 on the microphone, and it puts out a very uh, high voltage signal or a very hot sensitive signal, and that means you can turn the preamp all the way down in the GH4, and that gives a very nice clean signal. Um, you can get really nice clean signals at, uh, from this camera if you turn it all the way down. Um, and that's the big, the, the big key is turning it like all the way down to negative 12. So basically this mic level adjust, I wish um, I could assign it to one of the function buttons, which we'll talk about more later to get quick access to it. Cause I'd almost rather do it that way than having to touch the screen like this and then go in and adjust the mic level um, rather than having a function button where I could go directly into this menu right here, that would be kind of fun. But unfortunately, there's nothing that we can assign to a function button for this, this feature. All right, next up is special mic. Um, it's grayed out, um, can't use it because you need the Panasonic microphone, um, which I've used in the past. I actually did a review on it if you wanna to listen to see how that sounds. Um, I don't like the sound of it as as much as I do with this uh, Rode VideoMic Pro, and it's a 
pretty much the exact same price, but there is some things that that microphone uh, does pretty well. And one of the things is you can make it a stereo ambient microphone. So you're trying to capture ambient um, sounds like near a, a brook or a river or something like that, and you're trying to capture that, you could put it into the stereo mode um, right here on, on the display. Um, I can't choose this for you, but basically you can change if it's a narrow shotgun or a very a wider shotgun, or you can change it into a stereo configuration, which is pretty cool. I love that that part of that microphone. I just didn't like the sound as much. It required a lot of EQing and post to make it work, and you can definitely make it work, um, but that's pretty much why it's grayed out is because I can't actually, I don't have a microphone actually attached to it. It would actually sense the microphone through the cable and say, oh, you're using our microphone, so we'll actually display these features for you. All right, mic level limiter. I love this feature. Um, I think this is great. I, you should definitely leave it on if you're worried about overmodulating or distorting your audio. Um, so basically you just have a choice of either turning it on or off. So basically I've done lots of different tests on this where I've injected pink noise into the camera to see where the threshold of this occurs and it occurs at minus three. So anything above minus three, it just limits it. It's not like a compressor, it just says nothing's going on over minus three. So it clamps down on it really hard. Um, a few transients can get through really quick and can distort and that's why you definitely do want to monitor um, and listen with your headphones. Um, but it's very different than if you're coming from a background like I did from Canon with the AGC, the automatic gain control, which would raise the noise floor and would take a very quiet scene or audio and would raise that shh and you have this pumping and breathing with the noise floor. This doesn't do it. It doesn't raise the noise floor at all. It keeps the noise uh, the noise floor exactly the same. It only affects when you um, increase above a negative three signal in terms of audio. So great feature to have, um, especially if you're a one man band, leave the thing on because it can save your butt and you won't over modulate or clip your audio and get it all distorted and nasty. All right, next up is a uh, wind cut and you have a lot of different options. You can auto, high, standard, low. I've run a lot of tests on this. Um, I can tell you right now, high, is cut off frequencies around 200 hertz. Standard is 140 and low is about 70 hertz um, from the test that I've run. Now, I wouldn't recommend you leave this in the off position for the most part. And I'll give you an example where you might wanna actually engage it. Because what you're doing here basically is you're saying, like if I set it to high, I'm saying everything below 200 hertz, just don't record it. Um, it it's a very, steep knee on the curve basically where it's a high pass filter and it throws out all that information because that's where the wind is mostly when it's hitting your the diaphragm of the microphone um i would definitely leave it off and then in post you could do set that knee exactly where you wanted to on the high pass filter um the one instance where you probably would want to um maybe have it like on standard at 140 hertz um, would be in a situation where let's say you're doing an interview outside and all you can hear in your headphones is just the wind. It's the wind is so loud. It's being distracting. You can't hear what the person's talking about, even though, you know, later in post, you might be able to save some of it. And, you know, the best, the best advice here is just get out of the wind altogether. But, um, if you can't hear the person at all, then I would engage it to a standard art high, and then you can actually hear what the person is actually saying. So that's pretty much um, wind cut. For the most part, I would say leave it off. Lens noise cut, I really can't demonstrate to you because I don't have a power zoom lens. And what this does is basically reduces the zoom sound of interchangeable lenses that are compatible with power zoom. All right, next up is SS slash gain operation. So I come from a Canon background where I've used um, 50th of a second as my shutter and ISO as my way of controlling my gain on the sensor. So in here, if you're coming from like a, a film background, you can have it one way. If you're coming from a photography background, you can have it one way. And if you come from like broadcast, you can have it a different way. So the first one is if you're from Canon, like I ha was, um, you can have it like second slash ISO. So like a 50th of a second in your ISO, which I'm familiar with. Or if you're coming from a film background, you can actually have it in your shutter angle, which is in degrees and ISO. 
Or if you're coming from like a broadcast, you can have like a 50 of a second, but in terms of gain, it's in DB. So you could have like zero DB um, being like kind of your base ISO. And our last one on this menu is color bars. So again, I'm not any sort of broadcast engineer, um, so I'll, but I'll tell you what I know here. So Symphony, from my understand, is North America uh, in terms of what the bars and the tone that you'll get out of here. Uh, EBU, I believe, stands for European Broadcast Union. Uh, so I'm guessing Europe. And the last one, I believe, is for Japan. Um, so if you're in North America like myself, you would choose this one. And basically what this is for is for calibrating like an external monitor. So it's similar to what maybe you're seeing on the back of the display. Um, again, this is not something I do a lot. Um, I usually just take stuff off the car, bring it in my computer and start working on it. I don't have like um, a studio situation where I've got a whole bunch of different monitors. I want to make sure they all look similar. Um, but you can, you can definitely set it up that way. Now, going back to what I said before, you got to be careful because zero to 255, what we'd set on our levels um, showed that when you output these bars that the colors were off slightly. Um, but yet if you use 16 to 235, the colors were correct. They were sitting in each one of the graticules on the vector scope. Um, don't know what to tell you on this one. I'm guessing if you were wanting to output the correct color, I would probably recommend using the 16 to 235. Um, and I'll, if I find out more from um, Panasonic, I will probably add something below of what it's supposed to do.